Okay, so for the final session of the conference, I always do something called closing the interactive loop where I get off the stage, I invite some smart people who I respect to talk about what we've learned, what we've discussed throughout the conference, throughout this year's Supernova, reflect and also predict and look forward to the future. So I'll bring up Elizabeth Lawley, Jerry Mikulski, and Umer Haq. I know we're running a little bit late, so we're going to cut this a little bit short to end at four as close as possible to it. Um, so I will let you guys take over the stage. You want to go first? Sure. Hi, everybody. Liz, do you want to go first? Might as well get the image thing out of the way. Should be, should be snug there. Um, so I don't have a lot of slides, um, and I have to thank Jason DeFilippo for uh, making it possible for me to have slides, because the slides are all pictures that Jason took and are Creative Commons licensed, and uh, amazingly none of them came from CNN, none of them came from any authoritative media source, they are instead from, from the, the, uh, the world of amateur media, so, and eventually, hopefully, we will have, in fact, a picture up there. I haven't had problems with this before, so are we not getting signal? Did you hit the magic key combo to send them there? I haven't needed to before. It has always automatically just, just gone poof. There you go. Oh, look. Magic keys. Still no signal. Oh, cannot be applied properly? Hold on. All right, so wait. It's processing. No, it's not happy. All right, so I can't show you the pictures. So instead, I will tell you the things that I'm, I don't want to sum up the whole conference because I am guessing that when you leave here, most of you are not going to remember the bulk of what you heard here because that's what happens at conferences. We hear a whole bunch of stuff and we don't remember all of it. You know, we can take away only those nuggets of information that were something that really mattered. And I want to argue that the things that you're going to remember and the things that really mattered are the things that people said with passion. They're the things that people said with emotion. They weren't talking about facts necessarily, although some of them were. They were talking about things that they deeply cared about. So on Wednesday, I went to the panel on virtual life, and I heard Raf Koster tell people that all of their metrics were crap, okay? And the reason that they were crap is they didn't look at measures of devotion, at the money and the time that individual people spend, instead of counts like registered users, that eyeballs and buckets don't really tell us the details about what matters and what's going to be successful. So that was one person who spoke with a lot of passion. Um, I don't think anybody who was here yesterday morning is going to forget Clay's talk. I don't, think, um, I don't think the line, our tools have turned love into a renewable building material, is something that anybody who isn't passionate about the work that they do couldn't respond to. Okay? It was beautifully said, and it was a powerful message, and people will remember that. Okay? Um, Casey Claffey got up here and, and rocked the stage with all of her energy and passion about what she was talking about. And when she said, we don't have a culture of getting good data, you know, I wanted to stand on the table and cheer, because we don't. You know, we have data filtered to us through the people who often have the least reason to give us accurate information. And we need to start working harder to get the information that will help us make good decisions. Um, Elliot Noss waved his arms and said, spam and phishing are attacks on stupidity. Okay? Um, he is passionate about this. He is passionate about the people in his company. He is passionate about the services that he provides. And people respond to that. Okay? This kind of energy and emotion and enthusiasm. And David Weinberger, is there anybody who gets on a stage with more emotion about the things that he cares about than David Weinberger? For years, I have been watching back channels at conferences. And I was on one here. Not the one that they listed up on the slides, but the one that all the sort of alpha geeks migrate to, the one that lives on IRC, the one that I've gotten in trouble for being on on more than one occasion. And you know, there are 
couple of modes that we see in back channels. And one is a really helpful supportive role where people are posting URLs, where they're debating the discussion. It's really interesting. There's another mode in back channel when the, when the group on the stage has so failed in engaging the audience that the back channel becomes a festival of hilarity. Okay? Nobody wants to be the person on the stage when that's happening. But if it is, then maybe you need to think about the passion in your presentation. Okay? And then there's a third mode, and I see it every time David Weinberger gets up on a stage, and that's when the back channel goes dead. Because people are listening, whether they agree or disagree, whether they think he's right or wrong, his emotion and his presence make you pay attention. So I think the lesson that for me comes out of the past two days is that we need to listen more to the people who are passionate about this topic because they're the ones who have a, something really interesting to tell us. And that's all I have to say, and I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues here. I think we'll all, we'll all wind up talking, and then you'll just jump back in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So the first thing I was actually going to talk about is love. I wanted to pull out Clay's, um, Clay's point about love and how we don't talk about love. It's somehow taboo. It's not business-like. It's, it's unintuitive or counterintuitive. And it ties directly into the passion you were just talking about, the measures of devotion, all of the different ways that, that love for something is manifest. And in some sense, what we've just done is uncorked um, a whole world where this love was latent and hidden behind walls and tucked in closets and in all kinds of weird places. We just kind of connected everybody in irregular ways and unevenly, and all of a sudden this stuff can pour out to where it needs to be manifest. So, um, so I just wanted to first set that on the table. And then I wanted to maybe pull on some of the loose threads uh, that I've seen through, through the last couple days, uh, maybe highlight some of the weak signals, some of the things that, that were interesting that showed up only a little bit and, and pulled them uh, a little more deeply into the room. But one of those is about just humans. Um, I'm sort of a champion for ordinary people, and I think that we've heard lots of different pieces. The last couple sessions right now were really good about this. Uh, but this idea of the culture of expertise, and uh, whether experts are authorities, and what authority means, and how this all works, uh, and paying attention to humans. And I, I think we're, we're still n pretty far from actually paying attention to humans, and from understanding that it isn't about us anymore, it isn't about the suppliers. We have to make things available so that people, ordinary people, can solve the issues in their lives. So I've, I've been on a rant for 10 years about the word consumer. And a gentleman earlier from AOL said it so often that I started having an allergic reaction in my seat. Um, and when we're treated as consumers, we're being treated basically as gullets with wallets and eyeballs. And it's, it's not pretty. And we're targets, we're demographics. Listen to them. The language of, of consumer mass marketing is the language of a military campaign. Uh, you are paid by the impression, which is basically a little dent in your psyche, so that you remember them, please, pretty please, through repetition mostly. Not because it actually makes sense in your life. So companies are afraid to address humans, and they're even more afraid to let go of control. So Andrew Keene very beautifully exemplified the fear, the deeply seated fear of chaos we have in our lives. So we create social contracts, we create laws, we create governments, we do all these things. We create authorities and media companies and media distribution channels because we fear that we'll just degenerate into chaos if people are left to their own resources. And I look around and I look at governments right now, big G governments, I don't really like them. I look at the world situation right now, we're not in such a hot, hot, you know, hot kind of place. Um, a trillion here, a trillion there, you could probably build a lot of schools, do a lot of good, instead we're spending this all on a war. Um, and governments got us into this despite this very authoritative media, which effectively slept on the job, lost all of its credibility in my mind. Gone. History. Um, you can read a couple of different people's books about this. It's just fantastic what they, what they actually did. Um, so I think that we're, we, we still aren't really paying attention to humans and their normal lives. I'll give you a tiny example. Um, one of the early Web 2.0 mashup ideas that everybody said, ooh, ah, this is cool, was Housing Maps, which is now housingmaps.com, which got the fellow who created it a job at Google. Really nice resume. And it was only a couple hundred lines of JavaScript. But if you're actually looking for a property, it's not enough. And we all, go, we all look at that and we go, well, that's great, wonderful application. But if you were actually looking for a property, wouldn't it be great to be able to mark some of those properties and say, this one's good, this one's bad, this neighborhood I don't want, uh, to take photos on Flickr and upload them and then link those to the different properties or videos or whatever else, to have a little comparison table where you pick what variables matter to you and, and annotate each of the properties by those variables and then maybe share that out with your family and friends at the end and say, what would you guys do in this situation? That's just, and that's just my scenario for what I would love to see. So I think the challenge, we, um, John was talking about the platform of the future. We've had a lot of talk about what this platform looks like. 
The challenge is in many ways to provide a platform that lets people actually mix, remix, and redo things that do that and do a million other things, not all of which are nice things to do. So 10 years ago, I was in a brainstorming session at the Idea Factory with Nokia people, and we were coming up with scenarios for the PDA of the future. And uh, one, one person came up with, of course, you know, you want to go on a date with your spouse, and the help, the, your PDA helps you get theater tickets, but if it can't get theater tickets, it gets movie tickets, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, yeah, that's, that's fine, but what about, what about an opt-in application where if your now GPS-enabled cell phone um, notices that, you're within 15, uh, uh, that you've been within 50 feet of a known bar for more than 15 minutes, it calls your AA buddy, right? You're not going to see this advertised by Verizon. This is not going to be a service that a service provider offers, but it's a service that some people could actually need and would make their lives better. It's a way of closing the feedback loops in our lives in a friendly social way, not in an automatic way. And maybe if a bot sends you a note, you don't care. It's just an alarm. It's just a bot. Who cares? You know, even if your ankle buzzer goes off, uh, who cares, right? Um, so, so we're sort of still a few steps away from, putting, from dropping our ego and putting ourselves in the shoes of, and in fact, letting, letting go of control and letting those people go and build and do things. And I don't mean that every, every citizen out there goes and builds new applications and becomes a programmer. I mean a few people go and experiment and test these edges and build interesting and useful things which we then use and use and use. And I'm sorry, platform providers, all these people, um, your commodities. It's sad, but the, the sound you hear is monopoly rents being sucked out the window. You know, Craigslist tells me that the natural cost of doing classifieds, yellow pages, and personals is about that much. There's nothing to it. You can build this out for almost nothing. You, you charge only for a couple little narrow categories. Everything else is free. You put a little bit of money into a foundation. It's kind of crazy. And if you've been in the Yellow Pages business forever, you say, this is stupid, this is illegal, this is criminal. If you're in the newspaper business, you say, this is killing us. If you just look at it, you're like, wow, that's the natural cost of doing this. And that's what you have to compete with now. So let's just say Google rolls out Wi-Fi around the world or some other, or Muni wireless systems really grab hold. You're Verizon, you're everybody else. Right now, those things look like weeds in the sidewalk, but they're the, they're the mammals. These are the mammals, and they're trying to figure out how to organize, and now they have this platform where they actually can organize. So yeah, there's a lot of danger of chaos, and there may be futures where we have you know, Ender's Game kind of scenarios where people suddenly pick up uh, popular opinion and carry it in lots of different directions. We're going to suffer that and see that happen over the next couple of years. I'm actually pretty optimistic um, about how this happens. So the last thing, and there's a couple other points, but I'd rather um, pass it on to Umar. The last thing I wanted to bring up uh, was silence and the value of silence. And we've been talking, talking, talking for, uh, in my case, four days, because I was here for the unconference, then I was here for the challenge day, then I was here yesterday and today. I'm a little conferenced out. <laughs> and so I was going to use uh, just a few seconds of our time to uh, go quiet and ask that we stay quiet for a little bit and invite Umar to take us back out of the silence. <laughs> And uh, let's just do that for a moment. And, and maybe in, during that time, if you want to look around the room and see the new faces you've met, uh, think about some of the nifty things that happened during the, the sessions, whatever else you want to reflect on is, is great, because uh, Kevin has done a great job of creating a, a wonderful space here, and we've had lots of good, uh, good conversations. So let me just go quiet for a while. Okay. Are we? Is that? Whatever you'd like. Okay. You've got the con. Okay. Um, wow, that was uh, it's an introduction I'm not used to. Um, so l let me give you my, my, uh, my take on things, which, which is a little different. I, uh, I think what, what we've all been talking about in, in many different ways is, is, is a, great, uh, it's a great shift uh, in the economy, which, which is really simple, you know, and it's, and it's something we've maybe been dancing around, as some of us have, have discussed it uh, a little bit, but it's that, you know, and I don't, I don't want to uh, bore you with yet more graphs, but it's that if we think about it and if we measure it, in fact, what's happening in the economy today is that the number of interactions is exploding. It's yet another exponential curve, if you like, and, and we've seen many of them already, but I think this is as fundamental a, uh, a shift 
as, as the sort of ones that came before it, whether it was a Moore's Law or a Metcalfe's Law. But I think it's a big shift because it really turns the tables on people. And so this is where I kind of begin my, my take on, on supernova. And this is something I, I heard in, in Andrew Keane's voice. You know, this, this great shift in interactions erodes yesterday's sources of advantage. And it, and it pushes yesterday's strategies deeply into decay, whether they're sort of firm strategies or institutional strategies. And but this, was, this, in a sense, was what Andrew Keane was, uh, was really talking about. You know, this, this notion that, that uh, Cheryl from Google very nicely summarized earlier, that we're living in an era where distribution scarcity has been ended. But, but that's the tip of the iceberg. We're also living in an era where all of these sources of advantage are going away. Access to capital is ubiquitous. Channel control is, has gone away. Relationships are, are very liquid. And perhaps the biggest one is that there's enormous tensions for unbundling surfacing across all kinds of institutions, right? And this is kind of the, the, the flip side of, of what John was talking about with the Elance economy. And where that takes me is, is, is to a bit of an oxymoron, um, which is that we talked a lot about business models today. And we talked a bit about strategies as well. Um, but the oxymoron is that if these sources of, of advantage are eroding, we shouldn't be talking about strategies and business models because they are clearly in decay. And that's not what we need to talk about. Yet at the same time, we can see new economic forces at work, right? We live them, we feel them, we hear them, we touch them every day. And so, so what are some of these forces that we've been talking about? This is, this is a lot of stuff that, that, that I work on and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it in my own words, but, but I'm going to tie it back to a lot of the stuff we, we talked about. Today we talked a lot about things that get better the more you use them, or the more people use them. Economists talk about goods. These aren't really goods. These are what I call betters, right? So it's a fundamentally new category of thing. And the tools that we have to think about production and consumption aren't really adequate to deal yet with betters. And so when we jump to the level of strategy and business model and these things built around uh, betters, we, we really are, are getting ahead of ourselves. Another concept, uh, you know, that, that kicked off uh, Supernova, that we talked again today was, uh, was about love. The, the way that, that I put this again, the, the way that I put this is, I say purpose beats profit, right? And you heard this from Cheryl at Google today. She said, we, our, our model of advertising is different. We forego ad revenues to balance it in favor of both the consumer and the advertiser. But there's a deeply seated purpose there. It's not, it's not strategy by how or by what, which is how we used to do things before. It's strategy by who and by why, which is a very different thing. And I'll come back to that later. This morning, Chris Meyer uh, talked about, you know, what is, the, what is the organizational form of the future? Are, are firms really kind of decaying? Will they go away? John also uh, talked about this quite a bit. Um, my answer is, is really simple, and I think we can see it all around us. It's, it's that firms are, are one economic component, but now there's new ones. There's three new ones that I identify and I talk about a lot, markets, networks and communities. And these are very different ways to do things, right? Dig is kind of a market, MySpace is a network, Wikipedia is a community. And so will the firm go away, will it decay? No, but it will become remixed and it will become uh, uh, hybridized with markets, networks and communities. And firms that aren't part of this elemental shift are not going to make it into the future. Um, Evan uh, Williams talked about, uh, talked about the fact that you know, they, they're really experimenting. They, they don't really, they haven't got it all figured out. There's no great plan behind what they're doing. And, and this is the idea of, of shifting from a very Malthusian view of the world, where everything is dictated by sort of scarcity and this really dismal sort of view, to a very Darwinian view of the world, right? Um, John talked to, about it a little bit in terms of being adaptive, but, but I think it goes a little beyond that. Um, so, so, so the way that I put that is to say that Darwin beats Malthus. And, if we're still thinking in Malthusian terms, as most of us are when we go to, to boardrooms or meetings or what have you, we're really, we're really going to get left behind again. Um, Udi, Udi Monber from, from Google really blew my mind with that demonstration of translating the New Yorker into, uh, into Egyptian Arabic, sorry. Um, you know, and and that's, that's sort of, yesterday the economy was made up of specific things. Right? This is kind of what Dave Weinberger was talking about. You, you put your socks in the drawer. Today, the economy is made up of plastic things. 
things that can be duplicated and remixed and tweaked and hacked in many different ways. And, and, and the axiom that I like to talk about here is plastic beats specific. And I think Udi gave us you know, the best demonstration of this I've seen in ages. With, with one sort of simple thing, he absolutely blew the doors off the possible audience uh, for, for the New Yorker, right? It's, it's an enormously powerful economic thing. It's, it's a mind-blowing strategic concept. Um, and the last one, I think, uh, you know, the first time I heard it mentioned here was actually by Jerry on our first day. Um, and Jerry, we, we were kind of talking about consumers and, and, and resources and this kind of thing. And Jerry, and somebody said something about assets. And we kicked off on this whole discussion about assets. And Jerry said, no, I hate this word assets. What, what the hell is it? It's such, a, it's such a corporate word. And it doesn't have any of the, the, the resonances or the nuances of, of what these things are really about. And I think, you know, the, I feel exactly the same way, but I put it a little differently. I say that, and John talked a little bit about this as well, John Hegel, and the way that I put this is to say that flows beat stocks, right? So we're used to thinking about assets and resources, and these are what businesses are built on yesterday. Today, if we look around us, the revolutionaries are not building businesses on stocks anymore. They're building them on flows. So if, if we have these, these new economic forces to, to, to grapple with and contend with, how do, we, how do we reach out and, and you know, leverage them or, or touch them or make them work for us rather than being commoditized and vaporized and, and, and destroyed by them ultimately? We don't need to think about new strategies and business models. We need to think about DNA or what John called institutional innovation, I think. What is, what is DNA? You know, the, 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 there's a really simple example that, that I use sometimes and, and maybe, it's, maybe it's good, maybe it's bad that I use it today because we talk a lot about Wikipedia, but anybody can set up a wiki. Right? Anybody in the world can set up a wiki. What makes Wikipedia different is not the wiki, it's the DNA. It's this really elaborate but extremely different DNA that has evolved around the wiki that makes sense of the productive uh, contributions to Wikipedia. You know, superficially it resembles a bureaucracy or a hierarchy. When you dig a little bit deeper, it's radically different from, I think, almost anything that's, that's come before it. And that's DNA. Right? And I think that's really what we have been talking around. And it's been really interesting, for, for, for me at least, to, 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 to hear a lot of, uh, to hear a lot of what, what you guys have had to say about it. Um, I want to leave you like John did with, with two or three questions. Um, you know, the, the first one is that, that we talk a lot uh, in the Valley about, is it a feature or is it a company? And I think this is, this is just a, it's an absurd question. You know, who cares if it's a feature or a company? It doesn't matter who owns it, if it's creating value, right? The real question, I think, is, is it just technology or is there some DNA there, right? Because the DNA is what's going to nurture and sustain and explode long-run value creation, not the technology. So if you're being asked that question or if you want to ask that question, turn it around, right? And think about, is there DNA on top of, around, underneath the technology, supporting it, nurturing it? Um, you know, another thing that, that happens a lot in the, in the Valley and, and across the economy is that you know, the venture guys or the shareholders, the boardroom or whoever, you know, they, they want some kind of assets. And, uh, you know, for me, one of, one of the heartening things that came out of this was that I saw a lot of people starting to think in terms of flows rather than, rather than stocks. And, and I think the, the, the key question that we need to ask our, ourselves is, you know, which, which ones are we tapping? Are we tapping them? Which ones are we tapping? Are they the key ones? So we've seen the power of tapping flows, right? I mean, you, you go from nothing to Facebook in two or three years. You go from nothing to MySpace in two or three years. It's, it's enormously powerful. Um, uh, the, the third one, and uh, the second to last one, because I know you're all eager to have drinks, is, is about edginess, right? So we heard uh, Chris Meyer today talking about uh, the, the cozy and boundary of the firm, or this idea that you know, firms stop, but they don't really stop. There's still kind of coordination that goes on past the boundaries of the firm. So I think today we need to be asking ourselves, uh, where, where is the market network or community or, or some hybrid or something resembling them that lives at the edges of our firm? And is it appropriate to solve our problem? Because these are solutions to very different kinds of problems, right? Google never solved the music problem because it never occurred to them, I think, my take, to use a network. MySpace solved it because a network is the right solution for that domain. They're very different solutions to very different kinds of problems. Um, you know, the, the last one, I think, is, is the most elemental one, but I think it's the most important one, because this is one of the few places in the world where I think people ask it. And I think that's why this is, 
this is a really special place uh, for, for me to spend a lot of time. And that's, that's the question of purpose. You know? and, and most businesses are, are waking up to it. But like I said before, the, the key question I think today for, for strategy or institutions, whatever you want to call it, is, is not how or what do we do. It's why are, why are we here and who are we? You know, it's a, it's a DNA specific question. And you can see this question written all over the discussions that we've been having. You know, why is the media industry here? Does it create any value? Andrew Keane would say yes. Most of us, I think, clearly think no. We had the same discussion with the television. Why are you here? Who are you? How do you create value? My suggestion is if that answer isn't radically different from what came before it, in some, in some very meaningful way, it's not going to survive this great tectonic shift uh, to, to this, to this uh, sort of interaction economy. Um, so that's my take. Thank you very much. Jump in. We should, uh, I've got a, with one thread I wanted to pull on, but go ahead, Liz. No, uh, go ahead. Well, I wanted to pick up on the idea of flows with <coughs> stocks because I've been coming at the same two words from a really different direction, and I think maybe the integration of the two ideas would be um, pretty fun. Mm. Um, I'm actually a fan of stocks for the following reason. Um, the traditional media businesses, books, movies, music, TV, radio in particular, yep. are all based on flows because of the business model. Mm -hmm. So they want us to watch the flow because they insert ads in the middle of the flow. When we TiVo the flow and then skip over the ads, it breaks the business model, makes them very mad, upsets the whole apple cart, and people don't get paid at the other end. Mm -hmm. As a result, we actually get very few tools that help us make good stocks of information. So mm -hmm. you can think of a database as a stock or an archive as a stock, mm -hmm. but I mean more interesting stocks of contextual information, information that's been gardened, mm -hmm. of relationships, of other kinds of mm -hmm. things. So I'm a huge fan of making better stocks and making them easily accessible, available, mm -hmm. collaboratively developed. The Wiki, that's why I'm a big fan of wikis, mm -hmm. is that to me, um, the social dynamic that creates good wikis is about sort of farming, refarming, gardening, whatever metaphor you want to choose, imp ever improving mm -hmm. some good stock of deeply linked information. And I think Wikipedia has its limits, many, many limits. It's, sure. it's an encyclopedia. Sure. That's the model it's sure. working on. Sure. But um, I think we drown in the flow. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the big issues that came up a little while ago was, how do we navigate? How do we filter? Is, this, is it social filters? What are we going to use to get through the flow? But I, I think I don't know enough about your view because I love the fact that you know, mashups live off of RSS flows and APIs and this and that. And clearly the, the growth rates of some of the widgets and other services these days, that's happening because information is flowing and I love that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering, you know, does this mesh at all with uh, the kind of stuff you're thinking about? Yeah, I, th I think it does. I think a part of it is, is a semantic difference. You know, I, I see the reason that, that the media industry uh, was, was so firmly in control of things as as a stocks thing in the sense that you know, they had these huge stocks of intellectual property or they had another stock which was like a spectrum license or, or something like that, right? I think the flow was, was kind of secondary to, to, to the stock. So, so I, don't, I think that's more of a semantic thing than anything else. I think you're right. There, there is this, obviously, this huge problem of, of attention scarcity. And you know, how, do we, how do we get past it? And how do we help people, uh, how do we, how do we help people uh, deal with that? You know, the, the, the truth, I think, for that is that you know context really is is king in the next media economy and I you know for me I go back to markets networks and communities these are the different ways that we can provide context to people and they let us build stocks yeah but but uh, I think what they do more importantly is that, that that they channel flows in in really different ways and in ways that make sense um, and and they sort of avoid this this anarchic uh, dystopian future that, that Andrew Keane is painting. I think you know, if, if you use some of these things, then, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. They really do make a lot more sense than, uh, than I think, than I think uh, the, the critics would, would, would have it. So okay, so I'm going to jump in, and I'm going to say that context isn't king, mm -hmm. and content isn't king, experience is king. Okay? That the experiences that we have are what matters and the way we feel about them are what matters. And if we fail to delight people, if we fail to make them love what we provide, what we do, what we offer, then we've failed. And, you know, Google delights. You know, Google consistently delights. And, you know, in a business world, yes, they monetize that, right? Uh, but they can't do it unless they delight. Mm -hmm. And the companies that fail to delight consistently end up in trouble. And, you know, I just want to say the experience matters. 
You know, the way you make people feel about what they're doing matters and the extent to which you engage them. And there's nobody who knows this better than someone who stands in front of a classroom of 17-year-olds every single day. Okay? And I will tell you, it doesn't matter what the context is. It doesn't matter what the content is. If I don't send a message in a way that makes them experience the information, then I'm a failure and they walk out of there with nothing more. And the same is true here. If you don't experience this conference, if you don't really feel engaged and spoken to, then it's been a failure. And, and I think we all need to think a lot more about the experience. We need to think a lot more about the delight. We need to think a lot more about the fact that we don't live in a field of dreams world anymore. If you build it, they won't come. <laughs> they will go somewhere else where they find more delight. They have options now. Okay? We all have choices now. And what we need to be doing is building things that people want to choose. I'm, I'm seeing the long shadow of the experience designer approach us from the <laughs> I will say I right. only used five minutes total. <laughs> yeah. Uh, do you want to wrap, ask questions? <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I mean, I know some people have to leave, so I don't want to go too far over. So if you guys have any, any final words. I mean, that, that's actually, for me, a, a perfect way to end because that's to me that's always the challenge in this conference it's it's if it's not delightful for all of you and everyone that's that's participating virtually then it's a failure and then it's not going to be good and not going to be successful in the in the future so i i amen to that from my perspective well i was delighted thank you <laughs> all right thank you guys you want to you want to wrap up one just one final yeah. sentence which yeah. is um i just invite you to be mindful of what you found what you built whom you met on your way out and into the into the future Great, so I have a few final words, but thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.